Good day, my lovely listeners. You are listening to the Forty Orty Podcast. Tune in every week to explore inspiring stories and insightful information that dive headfirst into the world of autism and mental health. With all those tantalizing tongue twisters out of the way, let's get into the show. Today's podcast episode is proudly sponsored by Timo, the award winning app designed to support neurodivergent people just like yourself with routine and scheduling. Head to your app store and type TIIMO to learn more. This podcast has been put out to support World Anti Bullying Week. And if you want to get in on the action, you can join the Audi Power movement. This is a way to get everybody together to share their experiences with bullying, but also to empower the autistic community. All you have to do is post a picture on your social media, preferably Instagram, striking your best power pose or doing something that you love. Use the Audi Power hashtag, tag five friends and we can get this ball rolling. Hopefully this will give you an opportunity to share your story but also for us all to come together to try and enter that mainstream media and get autistic problems heard. Thank you so much for the support, and let's get back into the show. Good day, my lovely guests, and welcome back to my podcast house. You are being joined by the very lovely and oh-so-intelligent and attractive Mr. Tom Sanley. (laughs) How are you doing today? It's um, currently fairly late, but we've got a nice new podcast for you. It's probably not going to be late when this comes out, um, but it may be late while you're listening. Hmm. Today, we're going to be talking about autism, bullying, and isolation. It's not the most fun and positive topics, but it's definitely one of those things that many, many, many autistic people can empathize with. And it's something that I think we should do this. You know, we we need to talk about this stuff. It's one of the main issues. Hopefully this episode will go out on bullying week. I think World Bullying Week. Um, that doesn't mean go out and bully people. It just means raising awareness of bullying at school or in the workplace. And what better way to do that than to do a podcast. Today I'm joined by Charlotte from the Spectrum Girl Instagram account. She's a graphics designer and she is from Norwegia. Norwegian. Norway. God damn it. Norway. (laughs) (laughs) How are you doing? I'm great. Is this my cue? Yes. (laughs) Now, okay. So now I... (laughs) Yeah. Well, hello. (laughs) Uh, yes, I am currently known as the Spectrum Girl on Instagram, and uh, yes, I'm on there and I'm advocating for autism, physical and mental health issues, I would say. But like you said, my actual mm. name is Charlotte, and I am from Norway, the north of Norway. <laughs> the north of Norway. Yeah, so I'm from the, from Tromsø, and that is uh, on the Arctic, actually. And, Jeez, uh, really? Yeah, yeah, from above the Arctic Circle. Oh my God! So it's very far <laughs> north that I'm from, and but I live in Oslo, and I've lived here for many years, and um, I've studied art and music production, and then graphic design, and I started working as a graphic designer in some of the biggest design agencies in the world, actually in London. And that was easy, you know, it was easy for me to, to know, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but it, I mean, like, uh, if it wasn't for the neurotypical society uh, that was slowly and steadily tearing me down as a person, uh, I would probably have gone quite far with it. Because I mean, like, I, what, I, how far I got by being who I am, I'm autistic and all that. <laughs> I, I, I'm just, sometimes I wonder how far would I actually have gone if uh, it mm. wasn't for being constantly 
picked on yeah. and torn down and all that. Which I suppose is a good, you know, a good kind of lead into our podcast together because obviously you've had experience and I know that the working world is not always built like it, it's not always a hierarchy of competence. A lot of it is who you know and who likes you and who doesn't like you and it's it's a complex yeah. world. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I I haven't been liked very much when well actually <laughs> I was I, I the thing is that people love me at the job interviews and all that but after a while when I've worked for a while and people actually get to see all my quirks and weird stuff, no weird behaviorness or whatever. Then they start like uh, going from high to really low. It seems like though, because looking back at how all my jobs have gone and everything, it's gone to hell. And <laughs> and uh, yeah, so now I am on sick leave after having a huge autistic burnout. It peaked and it almost killed me. And uh, that was brought on by going undiagnosed uh, as autistic. Mm. And with multiple comorbid conditions uh, that I'm still being assessed for. So, so it's kind of something that you've battled with and, and it had to deal with and, and cope with for a lot of your, a lot of yeah. your life up until this yeah. point. Could you tell us a little bit about your, your Instagram work? Like what, why did you start it up? Yeah, so I started um, my Instagram account, The Spectrum Girl, after found some other autistic people's content on Instagram by chance. And then I was like, what is there? Uh, there's actually autistic people out there like me. <laughs> and I was like, oh, man. And that was in the beginning of 2020. I started like noticing lots of autistic content. And then in May, I think it was the 3rd of May 2020 this year, uh, I set up my own Instagram account and I uh, had the one thought in my head and that was like, I want to help people who are struggling with the things that I am struggling with or have struggled yeah. with. And I want to try and sh uh, help as many people I can, if possible, just by sharing everything that I've been through so people know they're not alone. I always think... And sort of, you know, say t say to myself, you now a lot of the, the sort of the trauma that I received when I was younger, you know, it was horrible, but it allowed me to experience it and understand it and um, understand the emotions. And, and sometimes that can be a very useful thing in someone who advocates and someone who, you know, des desires to raise awareness or, or lead in any way. Like being yeah. able to empathize with people who are going through similar circumstances is, is quite an important thing. Yeah, it has, of course, also uh, after a while, uh, it has become about raising awareness as well. So mm. um, because here in Norway, for example, nobody seems to uh, yeah. be aware that there is something called autism in adults and that we're walking around among everyone just uh, <laughs> trying to fit in and they don't know that autism is a spectrum and that there's this thing called masking and uh, all that so raising mm. awareness is something that I'm definitely uh, doing and I hopefully can turn inwards to my own country after a while I, I'm currently only reaching out to everyone except for in my own country actually yeah. so it's quite ironic isn't it well i suppose you you kind of if you if you've you've had those struggles in in within your own country i guess there is yeah. you know some some sort of anxiety around it definitely that is that's a good point because yeah i made a completely new uh email no instagram account completely separated from my old neurotypical existence and life and I didn't tell anyone and I still haven't told anyone in my old life uh, I would mm. say uh, about my new neurodiverse universe on the spectrum girl <laughs> <laughs> you know I haven't told anyone because it feels like I will ruin the magic and then I will go all 
go mm. back to lo losing confidence in myself and uh, people can be critical people can be people critical, can be critical yeah. yes and also they, they they're not ready yet i feel and i'm not ready yet but I, I've, it is the goal ultimately to finally get to tell all the norwegians as well one day mm. well, that's a good good goal to go for i mean when when yeah. people you know set up instagram accounts or any sort of social media or you know youtube and, and stuff like that we all have you know that kind of similar goal to to raise awareness but i suppose it's a lot more you, you have more of kind of a a niche target in mind that you want to improve which i think is always a good thing you know being able to narrow down what your your goal is and how you how you're going to get there and for me it's it's actually actually a lot to do with mental health and comorbidities and in particular bullying that happens in the workplace and schools which is why um, I really wanted to to get you on to talk about this stuff it's it's mm. something that I've had quite a bit of experience with myself I'm sorry to hear that it's it's always hard to hear that from other people but it's it's like it's it's the truth isn't it it happens a lot mm. especially for autistic people yeah it sucks it is and it's like I feel like it's a form of uh, torture mm. um being bullied or harassed it's just uh, awful mm -hmm. i mean going through it i mean it's it's life threatening mm. before we sort of go into the bullying and stuff mm -hmm. could you explain to us what kind of journey you went on post diagnosis what things in your life changed what mindsets did you acquire what different ways of of helping yourself and others did you did you get from that diagnosis so first of all i just found out about um being autistic when i saw this woman on norwegian breakfast tv talking about uh, being late di diagnosed with um, mm. asperger's uh, as they say here in norway still we don't say asd so uh, I uh, everything that she explained was just hitting hard home here with, mm. with me. And I was like, oh, my God, that is me. And uh, I think that's like almost four years ago. And um, I went to the doctor and I said in a by sentence or something, and I like, I think maybe I have Asperger's or something. And, and he would he just didn't look at me. It was like just shrugged it like, huh? What? And then we just talked about something else. It was it was wow. that little taken that little seriously. And that's a doctor. Uh, yeah, the doctor, my GP. <laughs> then again, a couple of years later, I uh, my suspicions just became stronger, and I took an online test or some, and I went to my GP again, and I and my psychologist, and then. Uh, my psychologist referred me to a neuropsychologist mm. for an assessment for Asperger's. And there I had such a high score that I didn't even have to finish the questionnaire. <laughs> that I, He was like, oh, yeah, no, you don't have to finish the last two questions or three or four or ten questions. I don't remember. How many. It was, so what does this question mean? And I said, he's like, uh, don't worry about that. Your, your score is already so high that uh, you don't have to. I'm like, oh, really? Uh, it's been, yeah, a revelation, uh, like for many others who get diagnosed late in life. Like, it's like having a second life, mm. like being born all over again and just discovering myself for the yeah. first time. Like, all the pieces uh, are just, well, nobody likes the puzzle piece reference <laughs> because the... <laughs> But 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 I don't know what else to say. It's like all the pieces are like falling into place, and um, things that I didn't understand about myself uh, before, like why I, for example, always felt the need to be so honest and direct to mm. people. I used to hate myself for that before, and I got so much criticism yeah. from uh, friends and colleagues and family members and random people like all my life so now I do not punish myself so much anymore for, so that's a huge that's relief that's really good yeah on the, this journey and that's one of the things that I I really just want to 
tell everyone not to hate, don't hate yourself. Because I think, um, you know, objectively, people, teachers and, and advocates and basically everybody talk, talks about getting to the heart of the, the problem and, and cutting through all the, the silly, wishy-washy difficulties, being direct and being honest with people. Mm-hmm. But as soon as someone asks you how you are mm. and you say, I'm really not doing very good, mm. and they ask why and, and you tell them, then it, it doesn't leave a good taste in the mouth like <laughs> they're not appreciative that you you've given them um, them an honest answer it's just... yeah they just look oddly at you like uh, uh... <laughs> <laughs> and then i become awkward and i'm like uh, didn't you just ask me uh how i was like uh... <laughs> it's so confusing <laughs> yeah like and they say we are the weird ones and all of that so i don't i don't get it De- deviating from the social norms which seem to kind of over overrun any sort of logic to communication <laughs> which we kind of need There's, we need to do that because that's like it's yeah. our lifeline to communicate with other people by understanding it and being logical about it and i used to be you know i used to kind of beat myself up about it and people would say you know, you're, you're not a very nice person. Oh, my God, yeah, I've heard that so many times. You know, if, if someone says, do you like this? And I say no, mm. then they mm. get upset with me. And I'm like, I'm just telling you the honest. Like, other people wouldn't be honest and open and, and say that. They just yeah. say what you want to hear and then talk about <laughs> it behind your back. Uh, I, I really just see myself in that so much. <laughs> oh, my God. So <laughs> my mom, for example, poor my mom, She uh, she's like, so I just bought this new jacket. What do you think? Oh, ew, uh, what an awful color. I would just like, say like straight out. like, and, Or she would say, like, I just cut my hair. And I would say, well, it just looks like the same short haircut that you always have. And I don't understand why you just keep cutting it. And I would say, she's like, oh, and, and I don't. So I used to go around hating myself because I, I, I thought that I was, were, I, I even thought I was a, psychopath at, at, a, at a one point oh, that happens life. a lot yes because i was like i i must be evil why do i keep saying <laughs> these things so straight out i don't understand yeah. why why do i why am i the only one and why am i so compelled to it's not just insecurity as well because y- you may feel that from other people but also people react badly towards you so it kind of reinforces yeah. that y- you're not a good person and it's it's a whole difficulty and if you don't know that you're autistic then you don't Mm. know about those traits and you can't be like okay I'm actually a good person I just work and behave a bit differently yeah and also (laughs) if you go around saying like so I'm actually a very good person that just sounds (laughs) like (laughs) strange just to just to reassure them that you you (laughs) know you're not a bad person (laughs) that that just makes you sound more suspicious too yeah Thank you for thank you for sharing that. We all go on our on our own specific and and different journeys when we get diagnosed. Some people kind of brush it under the carpet. Some people mm. pursue research like myself and sort of look into the literature. And yeah, I did that a lot. Oh, I sat on YouTube and mm. listening to all the different psychologists and yeah. specialists like Tony mm. Atwood. He was good and he's good he's yeah a good guy really to listen good. to he's probably one of the only people that i can listen to and not receive the same information that i've heard over and over again he's yeah like, he brings up new stuff and he's he's quite he's quite integral to the public awareness of of autism and stuff and he is uh <laughs> he's good in the way he's talking about it. he's like he's not make making autism sound like a disease is making it sound like it's actually it could be an asset, and mm. that's how we should. Mm. It's like uh, being a superhero, isn't it? You've you yeah. you're really good at some things, but you've got weaknesses. You have your kryptonite. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone <laughs> Funny, else is just a kryptonite. <laughs> everything but work. <laughs> that's my kryptonite. <laughs> oh yeah. So yeah, just walking outside is my kryptonite. <laughs> oh, <I'm> just, <laughs> no. well, talking yeah, to depends. the shopkeepers. And the the, yeah. ge- the general public. Ugh. Yeah, God. because you know, I come out and I go to the go to the shop, and then I start talking lots and lots and lots about all these 
weird stuff to to the shop uh, clerk or whatever i will just start start talking like and they would be thinking i'm crazy what was wrong with her mm. why she's talking so much what why is she talking in details about this scarf why and i'm like <laughs> well uh, oh shoot i should not have gone outside today yeah i could yeah I, I like talking to the person next to me on the bus stop like wow look at that dead bird on the sidewalk oh poor bird let's go and bury it <laughs> but of course if i'm in a really really bad place i will just put on sunglasses and a and a, and a cap and a scarf up to my nose now we have face masks because I of the covid so that's good uh if i if i don't want to see people i can't get looked upon hmm. i have it's it's two completely contrasting sides it's nothing in between it's like either i'm completely uh outgoing or i'm completely shut in today as as we said we are talking about isolation and bullying we are going to be kind of looking at different stages and kind of building a, a good kind of full picture how how bullying and isolation can affect our mental health our social life our mentality or mindset towards the world and of course our behavior and i think we should definitely start at the beginning what is your most early experience of bullying or isolation in kind of your your younger years yeah first of all i have uh, blocked out so much of my earlier life as many other people on the spectrum do i have found out so Mm -hmm. i did not know that but i also do the same (laughs) yeah yeah i just don't remember i'm like yeah what is my earliest memory of anything really uh so but i do of course have memories and a few and um well the earliest memory of uh, isolation and bullying would probably be like in when i was just starting school uh first grade and uh, like one of the first days of school i was being chased around the block uh by some other boy who was mm. uh, shouting fatty <laughs> after me but i wasn't even fat i don't understand like thinking well that's not that's not <laughs> kids are not a- logical Anyway, so we run around, um, run around the block like uh, round and round and round, and then suddenly I passed around the corner of uh, the school building, and my head just uh, smacked into some taller or bigger, not that tall, because my head had to reach to smack into the other head. <laughs> and I smacked the head, and I kind of fainted, and I got a concussion. So I, I just laid there on the school grounds and your first day of school yeah it was one of the first days couple of weeks of school i i don't remember and i was just i lay there and um, the school bell rang and the teachers and the students everybody just disappeared and i i remember just waking up laying out there on the school ground uh, and uh, i was all alone Uh, the teachers had not noticed that i was missing and I was six or seven years old, and I couldn't find anyone. And they had gone down to another school building that I still had not visited because it was like mm. in the early days of school. So I remember some kids in a kindergarten inside a fence next to the uh, grounds where I was. Uh, I got up. They were shouting at me like, "Hey, hey, you!" And I'm like, "Hey, where is everyone?" They're like, "We don't know." And I like, just remember walking home and going to bed and you should never do that when you have a concussion well anyway so that's my first uh, kind of uh, memory of a kind of quite serious situation where not even the teachers could notice that i was mm. missing and i had just been bullied into a concussion and uh, forgotten laying yeah. on the school ground it's not a great sort of first early memory to have no but I didn't understand it at the time uh, that it was quite serious. I, I I didn't really think about it until I was an adult. Mm. But that's also part of like my learning curve to understand the social situations that are not so good. You know, it mm. has taken me a lot of time to understand that so many things that has happened to me were actually so bad. And I'm kind of glad that I did not understand it when I was uh, younger because it may have had a much more severe impact at the time. 
for me. Mm. Kind of grateful that I was so oblivious. I'm such a late bloomer. <sighs> mm. You know, it's it takes time to pick up on all of the little social cues and all of all of the rules and everything. So yeah, I didn't understand that I was being bullied. Yeah, I, kind of um, saved me. I do under- understand what you mean. I think when when I was at school, it was it was less about sort of physical targeted bullying, and it was more about how the other people, other kids my age, tr- like treated me. Mm. Because I didn't really understand about like the the social things, you know. If there was there was this one time where I went to a party and um, we were sort of sat in lines and stuff, and we were playing a game. Some of the other kids told me to to sort of blurt out swear words towards the uh, the girls in the group. So I just started doing it, and obviously the adults jumped in and were like, "Oh my god, like, oh. we need to get this kid out of here. He's oh. he's a, not a good kid. He's a bad kid." And I got mm. quite heavily punished for it. Oh man, that really actually reminds me of a so similar situation. But I'm not. Just go ahead, you. It was just like little things like that, you know, just on a more frequent basis. You know, maybe it, it took a lot of effort for me to join in on group games and stuff. I wasn't at that age. I didn't really. I wasn't that kind of shy and withdrawn. I was very. Um, I was the class clown, so I used to get in trouble a lot. But I liked to make people laugh. That yeah, was kind of my too. my thing. And the other kids didn't really intimidate me. Well, that's great. Yeah, it was good. It was good in some situations, but um, I, I did get into a cu- couple of fights when there was just th- th- small things. It, th- a similar situation. There was this guy who was walking his dog, and he was outside the school grounds, and all of the kids went up to the fence, you know, just to see. Oh, there's another person out there, and mm. uh, someone told me to tell him to like f off, and um, oh my, <laughs> and I did that, and then I got in trouble, and other kids were like, "You stop saying that," and I was like, "Well, it's okay. Someone's told me it's okay to say that." Yeah, and then they started on me, and uh, we had a fight. Most of my experience with early life things like that would be more to do with isolation, so like parents of my friends not wanting me to go around because yeah i was you know i didn't understand things and i was a bit naughty in their eyes oh yeah same here <laughs> i think a lot of a lot of kind of those those early years experiences is just not necessarily feeling bad or upset or left out it's more just feeling confused constantly yes. by everything oh, that's yes. like the main thing around the end of primary school so like around about year six year five year six Mm. that's when like people that I was very good friends with started to see me as weird and see me as uncool Mm. or strange Mm. you know like things that we play together like um games or something that that perhaps weren't for people our age so they just lumped me into this category and and just not want to associate with me because I was weird I don't know if it's a coincidence or if this is normal for but at that age when I was around 12 uh, the same thing happened to me the exact same thing like what you're saying and that person was like my best friend like they were like my yes. anchor yeah they just just told me to get lost yeah I said, I don't, exactly I don't see the you same thing yeah it was you awful. like all these things that you shouldn't like and mm. yeah that was that was difficult but that that was our early experiences <laughs> Eerily similar. <laughs> yeah, it was just it's just very, very, very similar to me. Uh what I went through. Well, girls are can be really, really mean though. Uh, mm. okay, so a little bit back in like in third and fourth grade, a new girl moved into town and um my teacher uh told me to uh or asked me if I could uh go to her house and wish her welcome to the neighborhood and when this new girl came she was half american half egyptian who had moved to north norway the arctic and so <laughs> so exotic mm-hmm. so i went up to her house and she lived in a big nice house and i we were kind of lower middle class almost, like almost to the border of poor and in Norway, that says a lot because Norway is a rich country. So um, I was like, wow, look at this house. And I went up there, knocked her door and like, hey, her, her name was Nor. Nor. 
yeah, N O O R, <laughs> Nor. It's Egyptian, I think. And uh, I knocked on her door and like, hey, and she's like, hello, <laughs> like in those movies from you know mm. those teen movies, like looked yeah. at me with these <laughs> eye rolls and like, hello, <laughs> and like, <laughs> and uh, I think we were like ten years old actually, yeah, and. Uh, shouldn't be rolling eyes when you're 10 years old but this girl she was she knew what she was i don't know where she had learned these things but no one in our class was this advanced yet <laughs> but she came into and she was advanced and i'm like well uh i'm uh, charlotte and i'm i'm in your class and the teacher told me to wish you welcome and show you the school and so yeah you want to come with me on the bike and i'll show you the school and she's like um Nah, I don't know. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> so she was like, <laughs> she was so cool and treated me so cold and weird. And so that was my first kind of uh, experience with one of uh, those kind of uh, personality types uh, that was like out of it was like out of a movie. The the way yeah. she behaved, like from Clueless, kind of the the, the those girls with uh, those cranky voices, like ow. Oh. What do you want? I don't want. I, I don't think I really want to be around you. Yeah, You've got bad yeah. fashion sense. <laughs> <laughs> yes, like that. And I, I just remember not understanding her way, and because like, mm. we were just like hillbillies living up there in the north, and like, uh. and then whatever. So, so she started our class, and um, uh, we had a drawing. Uh, drawing session uh, and uh, I walked around looking at everybody's drawing so I was the best drawer at school for a, a very long time it was like one of my top things to do was mm -hmm. art so I've always been the creative type and um, went around looked at everybody's drawings and I still felt like I had uh, a bit of responsibility to integrate nor so I went mm. over to her desk and I said, uh, looked at her dinosaur, which she had drawn. And I said, oh, wow, that is such a nice dinosaur. And then she kind of just looked half like eye rolly up from her yeah. desk to me and said, uh, I don't want to talk to you. Why should I talk to you? You're fat. Oh my god! And I was like, uh, I was literally so, the trope, the movie trope. I, yes, I was so taken aback. I I did not understand what she said. I had not experienced uh, anything when I was more conscious about people's behaviors because I had grown a few years. So now I understood things like that more, but still I did not understand how that could happen because I had not done anything wrong to her I had not mm. been mean to her I had not I had only done her nice like tried helping her and I tried to give her a compliment and I knew that much that I, I could tell like really bad from really good so I just remember kind of going into shutdown I just became really quiet and I went back to my seat and I sat down and I was like just really really pondering like why what happened like why would someone be so cruel out from kind of out of thin air so that was like my first so the first class bullying who called me fat uh, and ran around the building was kind of like teasing and kind of like it was a lot more childish but this was really calculated like she was trying to sort out who were the cool people to hang with and who were not the cool people to hang with and when you're seven yeah. years old you're not that advanced but anyway uh somebody had heard her and i don't know if it was my teacher or someone but suddenly she came crying to me after uh lunch and said the teacher told me to tell you i'm sorry <laughs> and i'm like, what <laughs> So somebody had heard her and, um, yeah, she had gotten a real talking to, telling off by the teacher who had not taken lightly to it. So that was like, I got defended or whatever, yeah, yeah that, that time. But that was the first and the last time that I would ever be defended in a situation like that. So it's time for a quick mention from our sponsors. Timo. 
If you love visual support in your scheduling, Timo is for you. The app was designed for people with ADHD and autism and helps empower users to schedule visual routines that work. Users say that Timo can help reduce stress and support executive function, which are both two things that I struggle with myself. Learn more at www.timoapp.com or just type in T-I-I-M-O into your search bar. Thank you so much to my Patreon supporters, Shelley Nearing, Julian Marks and Patrick Vedi. Your support means the world. Anyway, let's get back into the show. I suppose that's a good kind of point to, to segue into the next bit, which I think is definitely the most the time in, in an autistic person's life that is fraught with trauma and bullying and isolation and all sorts of nasty stuff. The late years, the, the secondary school or, or high school years, how was, how was that for you? Oh, man, not good. <laughs> one, one thing that I, I kind of gathered from the, like the podcast and, and people that I've talked to and stuff is that there's a point at which everyone just kind of suddenly after one summer, like the social IQ just goes up and they, everyone just understands the social things mm-hmm. and you're kind of just left drifting mm-hmm. not really knowing what's going on <laughs> yeah it's drifting it's uh, it's very sounds very relatable but my mom was a single mom divorced when I was three years old and uh, when I turned 10 we started moving I, I we started moving around the whole island of Tromsø and I did not have anywhere to settle so that made things a lot more worse about the whole drifting around thing. I was like literally drifting. Mm. So I had to change a uh, school district from my uh, elementary school to um, a junior mm-hmm. high. And uh, so when everyone that I went to elementary school with went to the same district as uh, junior high, and uh, uh, I had to start all over with someone I hadn't, who didn't know me. And uh, in a in another district that were more rich people like or well off people or whatever who lived in houses while mm-hmm. I lived in a shared building complex apartment building or whatever yeah and um, that's where I grew up and but my mom she uh, got a boyfriend who lived in a house so that would be the first time I would live in a house when I was twelve actually uh, started high school and uh, I had a stepsister that I lived with who had lots of friends in that junior high. She was very popular. And she was the type of girl who would talk about her next door neighbor. And she would make me draw the neighbor fat. What is it with girls and bullying fat other other <laughs> girls for being fat? A lot of emotional kind of abuse, isn't it, with girls? Uh, she, My stepsister asked me, to draw a fat girl. And then she would say, that is my neighbor. And I'm like, what? Eight years later, uh, that neighbor girl, she um, committed suicide. She wasn't, yeah. uh, So, uh, I mean, like, bully people. And uh, yeah, yeah, she committed suicide. So sad to hear. Yeah, it was really sad. And I didn't know at the time that I was drawing her because my stepsister wanted to make fun of her. I didn't, but I still feel bad about that drawing. Yeah. It, the drawing never went anywhere. It went into the trash, of course. But um, it was so it's so baffling to me still, like why people are mean. What is it that m- compels them to be mean? Like straight out of the blue, it's never, I never understood it. I think it's um, when kids go into teenagehood, there's actually like certain parts of your brain that that develop more slowly than others. Mm. And those bits develop when you get to teenagehood. So like self-consciousness is like the biggest one. Mm. So everyone feels like they're the center of the tension and the world's revolving around them. And so, you know, people who have a lot of like a big ego want to make sure that they feel superior to other people so that that kind of matches their 
hmm. image of themselves. It sounds like like the animal jungle or something. Yeah, it's it's a social hierarchy. Hmm. You know, the the people that that are deemed not acceptable are bullied and isolated away from the group, and the people that hmm. sort of pander to them and join in on this this highly egocentric person mm. get to to be with them and get to be one of the it crew mm. that's how i kind of view it it's very much like kind of using the the monkey part of your brain mm. you know the emotional oh look at me <laughs> like i'm i'm better than all of you and it's only it's only until like recently in adulthood that i've sort of kind of revisited that you know just to kind of understand I think a lot of kids around that age literally just think about themselves. Like it's it's not a lot about other people. Mm. It's very new to be able to view yourself. You know, you you're very conscious about getting changed around other people and how you look and how you stand in in different social groups and yeah, I was conscious. People about don't think that. about other people. But I I don't remember I don't remember being conscious about uh, being kind of. Uh, better or or bossing over people or something like being kind of like that i don't remember well you're not you you probably just didn't you weren't narcissistic i didn't understand you didn't have an inflated ego (laughs) well uh i i don't really uh, yeah i don't i did not have an inflated ego i think that is something that i would have had to be taught specifically so but anyway um at that time from when I was age 12 to 14 uh, where I lived in that house and went to that junior high with my stepsister things became quite uh, shit uh, as time went by yeah uh, so I started to uh, gain a little bit of weight not too much but a little bit uh, so that's, of course, never good when you're living with a evil stepsister who likes to bully people who are overweight or mm. not even overweight. I, I was far from it. Uh, so was the neighbor girl, far from it. Uh, I remember walking in the corridor of the school and my stepsister was in front of me with some of the other uh, boys she went to class. They were like in one year above me. So they were the older mm. and cooler kids. I was like yeah. right behind them. and. I just got the door slammed right in my nose. They didn't hold the door open for me. They just actually slammed it in my face uh, on purpose. And uh, like little gestures like that. And then um, I would later hear from another very unpopular girl uh, that when we were sharing experiences later uh, about who said what about us because we try to like find out like okay so we are obviously unpopular both you and I so who talks behind my back I would ask her and she would ask me like yeah so who talks about my behind my back so because of course when we were around uh, the people in the class and if she wasn't there I could hear what they would say about her and then Mm -hmm. the other way around so that way I found out that People would hide when they saw me come walking down the corridor. They would be like, oh, that's Charlotte is coming. Let's hide. We don't want to have to talk to her. So then they would do Mm -hmm. that to uh, Nina, the other girl that I would um, uh, report back to as well. I told her, well, they do the same thing to you. They hide. And they even had me hide along with them. That's how cruel they were. I I remember just one time hiding and not really realizing kind of the seriousness of it. And then Mm -hmm. also... you were kind of joining in. Yeah, but I I didn't... The thing is that I did not mean to do it. Mm -hmm. And when when we were uh, talking about it, it kind of dawned on me as she walked past and when it was kind of too late, what was happening. I was so slow at uh, realizing. And uh, then when she and I were kind of uh, exchanging information about who would talk bad about in our backs, uh, yeah, we were both kind of surprised that, oh, they, she, I think she also had had to hide from me with the other girls. That's just, I mean. That's crazy. 
That's absolutely, that's insane. Yeah, it is really mean and cruel. <laughs> it is cruel. It's awful. Yeah, so as the years have passed, that's when I have realized how much it's kind of impacted me later on because I, I, there were so many things confusing me when I was a teenager, young, like a, when I was a mm. fresh teenager. Early teens were kind of really cruel. And then one time, like the thing when I was 16, 17, not very long before I moved away from that city, I was in a clothing store. So that's in not junior high, but senior high. Is that what it's called? Yeah. So yeah, uh, just a bit later in before college. High school. Yeah. So. I, I I had gained even more weight, but this uh, I I had gained like thirty kilos uh, very quickly. Was that kind of like a comfort eating thing? Yeah, yeah, no, it was kind of more like not understanding what a calorie was, being com- oblivious. Nobody yeah. had ever taught me about anything, so I'm kind of angry with my mom for never teaching me what a calorie was but instead like saying ah oh, i think you've had enough well why i don't know because i don't understand she should have told me because it has calories and this has fat that has, nobody told me like so when i was alone i would be like well nobody knows that i can eat you know candy now so i would just eat that constantly and i gained 30 kilos like 60 pounds for over a couple of years and when I was inside this clothing store, I was looking at uh, clothes and I saw in the security mirror that uh, one girl from my high school that I had moved to the new district, plus one of the girls that used to be my best friends in elementary school were together. So they had become friends somehow. I don't know. But um, it's a small town. And they, they pointed at me in the security mirror. They didn't see that I could, that I was looking straight at them in the security yeah, mirror. Kind of behind you back. And they pointed at me and ducked behind a clothing rack and like uh, walked out with their backs hunched, mm. walked away because they did not want me to see them because yeah. nobody wanted to be around me or have anything to do with me and that has quite a bit of a toll on like yourself and in your ability to kind of yeah you know if people treat you like that on a constant basis you you, you don't feel a part of the school or mm. the town or the, or the world or yeah so that was quite terrible to experience but still it's far from one of the things that i have taken the hardest in my life uh, bullying wise yeah. yeah, that comes to my adult life and the, in my work life not too long ago. I guess our experiences do differ like a little bit because I know just from reading about bullying and, and stuff like that that girls, t- girls tend to be a lot more emotionally kind of bully whereas dudes tend to be a bit more physical mm-hmm. and aggressive and in your face. Mm-hmm. I've experienced both of those because I was in a group with both boys and girls. I, I literally, I, I received bullying throughout my day from many different sources. The first being, as soon as I got on the bus, there was this kid who was a little bit younger than me, so just young young enough and small enough that if I was to do something, I'd get in trouble. And he'd harass me, he'd put like bags, he'd spit in bags and put the bag over my head and constantly what? taunt me and poke me and, and jeer at me. And I'd, I'd make all attempts to try and surround myself with other people sitting on the bus, mm. um, but sometimes I just couldn't. Mm. It was basically on the, the stop directly after me. Mm. And um, yeah, that, that that was constant for like years. All terrible. The time. Put bag over your head. Yeah, Ooh. but that's just the bus. Oh, like when I got into school, sure, classes were like m- my best place. I was I was quite intelligent for my age. I, I read at quite a, a young age, and I, I was very good at science, and I could do wasn't the best at art, but I could I could do all of the subjects to quite a high level, and um, that was my safe haven. Hmm. Breaks would either consist of me in the early stages of secondary school of or high school. I would I would be in a group of guys, and they were great guys. They were lovely, hmm. and we, we had lots of fun, and we sort of ran about, and we played football, and. There wasn't really any problems until these two particular boys who obviously 
had a had a few self esteem issues. They were quite they they, they were the typical male bully. Mm. They would you know come come down and harass my friends and harass me and you know just get like a rubber band and like just you know flick it at us and Ouch. stuff like that and steal our ball and kick it over the the school and it was it was quite quite difficult because it was like from all angles I was getting bullied. Mm. And the only place that I could go to was the library. Like there's a teacher there. I was safe there. Mm. Anyone who made a ruckus, the, the people who tend to be bullies were, the, were quite loud. Yeah. So they tend to get kicked out. And yeah, there, there was a few times where, you know, people had hit me. I was, there's one time where I was lining up for class. I was like, oh, it's a good lesson. I'm going to do some English. And I was excited for it. And then this group of the, the popular guys, air quotation marks, mm. they sort of ganged up on me. Mm. One hit me in the balls. Ouch. And, um, I didn't react because I was like, if I don't react, then, you know, I'm showing that I'm tough. Mm. But what I ended up happening was the entire, t- like he'd gone off to his friends and said, hey, look, he can get punched in the balls. And oh, can be no. Okay. So they all came and crowded around me and started levering me in the balls constantly. Jeez. And it was, it was awful. Oh my God. I can't believe it. Yeah. <laughs> that is just, I mean, Jesus, it sounds like uh, unbelievable. That was okay. Like a comparison, like the emotional oh, side okay. of the bullying was the the worst. Like people within my group who who thought I was a bit strange and weird um, would make up names for me in order to talk about me in front of my face. I'd have you know a lot of instances where you know people would message me and sort of act all friendly and stuff, but then in in real life would completely ignore me or. Or just join in with the other mm-hmm. groups, you know, kind of ridiculing me. It was it was just from all angles, all the time. You know, I started self harming, so that's terrible. It was like the only place that I could go to was classes, mm. the library, and then my taekwondo classes. That that was my life. Meeted up with other friends and stuff outside of school for the first two years. After that, pretty much nothing. Mm. So I. Instead of learning a lot of the social skills, I became very, very, very withdrawn. And I sort of tried to limit who I talked to. Well, it's no wonder. I mean, oof, that's... Pe- pe- people, you know, treat, treat me like a, like the, the weird one. Like, as you said, kind of mm. hiding from you. and. Mm. But the problem is, is that the only place that I felt safe was on things like Facebook. Mm-hmm. So I, I messaged people and I got made friends with people. Mm-hmm. The same people that I was conversing with every night and talking to mm-hmm. a lot, they, they treat me really badly at school. That's awful. It's, it's just there's just there's a lot of things, which is it's why I kind of I'm, I was kind of laughing when I mm. wrote, wrote this this one question about secondary school because it's it's literally like the the most hell. Like, and I I developed so many mental disorders from mm. it. I became dissociated because of you know the constant bullying. I had to kind of dissociate quite a lot. A mm-hmm. um, lot of anxiety, panic attacks throughout school every day. Yeah, not coming into school. <sighs> but then it's like objectively, teachers and parents they don't really understand. No, they don't see it. So strange. I I, I don't want to talk about it. You know, keep keep going on about it. What? Like... No, talk about it if you. Or is it too much for you to talk about? I understand if you don't have the... It's it's quite hard. Like, you know, as you said, you blocked a lot of stuff out from your childhood and stuff. It's it's the same with me. Like, I've, I've been to psychologists and stuff, and mm-hmm. they've, they've asked me about my experiences at school. And I, like, my brain just switches off and I dissociate mm-hmm. and I can't do it. It's like my brain's trying to stop me from reliving it yeah it's it really did scar me quite heavily no school. wonder it is a s- survival uh, mechanism so it's only natural yeah. if we don't uh, have any way of coping like like for example that who knows what would have happened and um, <clears throat> yeah. it's a reason for it so we can hold hold on until we have found some help or something that's why yeah. we have that mechanism it's difficult like now in my life I've worked on my social skills and I'm confident I know how to protect myself I've done a lot of different martial arts and boxing Mm. and 
I feel very confident in myself. I, you know, I have a relationship and I have friends that, that I'm close to. Mm. It's it's like where I was six or seven years ago, or it's it's just it's a completely different person to who I am now. I'm so happy for you. That is so good to hear. And uh, I do sort of suffer with the the consequences of that time of my life, but mm. I'm a lot better nowadays. It's just you know we got to try and tackle this. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> like, yes, <laughs> this is this is not on. <laughs> yeah, we have to somehow tackle it. And uh, I, I mean, a lot of it for me, coping with it is to have kind of this morbid uh, humor, uh, self irony about it, and sometimes I have. Mm. I have coped by talking about uh, my traumas very directly and honestly out uh, straight out to almost strangers and they would be gawking at me like so shocked and I would be l- completely un- untouched by it like yeah 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 no 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 I was yeah that happened and all that yeah yeah no I mean like I'm fine I'm fine <laughs> so <laughs> it's kind of yeah I I I completely get that mm, like <laughs> yeah it's so strange kind of like <laughs> some people receive it well mm-hmm. and those are the people that I try and stay in contact with you know those yeah. people who are like thank you for telling me like it must be you know it's hard for you people to be honest about this stuff Okay, so <laughs> we spent a long time on this one. I, I apologize no, no, for, no. for ranting so much about no worries. Um, secondary school. The absolute worst. I hated it. Yeah. <laughs> People say you'll miss school. My dad said I miss school. I'm like, no. No. Nope. <laughs> no. Nope. I'm very happy. Well, but <laughs> very the happy thing now. is that I wish <laughs> I could turn back time and do things differently, but of course it's impossible. But but that has bothered me a lot, those uh, things like thinking oh i wish i could go back and i wish i could have done things differently so i would never have to do experience this and that and this and that but of course everybody has those thoughts but it can really mess with your head thinking like that and i think autistic people who have had trauma think those thoughts even more because we have such good long-term memory also trauma just keeps on replaying and happening in so such detail like those things that we do remember we really do remember it and um terror is is completely awful nightmares and uh flashbacks and yeah it's i mean it's ptsd of course uh, so it will be flashbacks but yeah just to um kind of move on to the the next question Mm because i know you said that a lot a lot of the, the 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 difficulties and the trauma happened you know kind of in your in your adult life yeah because I know that you went to university. Mm-hmm. What was your experience at university like? So I didn't get to go to university until quite late, in my late 20s, uh, because I, mm-hmm. I was math, I am math blind, and I, I, um, I flunked uh, high school uh, eventually because also my math teacher bullied me. So... Uh, <laughs> He would kind of make an example of me in uh, class in junior highs. Brilliant. Well done, teacher. Yeah. He would like say, so can anyone? Well done. Yeah. A- anyone? Uh, let's go through this uh, little math problem, except for Charlotte, maybe, and Daniel. <laughs> and I would be like, okay, I'm completely stopping going into math class. Mm. So I, of course. Give him a poison apple. Yeah. <laughs> Put it on his desk. Uh, Give him yeah. a nice shine. Yeah. So that was when I was 14 and uh, up until I was uh, graduating uh, senior high when I was, uh, what, 18. I, I did not attend math and I flunked math. And also say this, when I moved to Oslo and I was like in my mid-20s, I uh, I tried all every year to apply to university uh on special terms yeah special circumstances like because uh, you can there are some a few reserved spots for people who are um, more mature and uh yeah if you don't have math or whatever could actually get accepted but i never got accepted and i i, I and i wanted to study art and i'm like why do i have to have math to study art and i wanted to, <laughs> to study like antique culture and architecture and art and I couldn't because I didn't have a math grade I'm like 
no why <laughs> and so i tried and tried and and um the job center in norway kind of the equivalent to it they kind of sent me to uh a school for young adults who are struggling uh, psychologically. So I had I had to take up uh, Norwegian and history and math because I kind of I flunked all three of them. But the history and Norwegian I flunked because the teacher was really really mean and I was scared and I didn't go to class. <clears throat> so I I did the, the Norwegian and I did the history very good, but still I could not uh, do the math. I couldn't do the math. So my uh, option was to uh, pay my way through uh, university to vocational school that costs a lot of money and then go abroad for my third year of a bachelor. Is that when you came to the UK? Yes. So it's, a, it's been like I've, I was I have been very determined because I have always uh, measured myself like my intelligence uh, to have to prove that I'm not stupid or and I had a, a very mm -hmm. uh, strong feeling of having to prove that to everyone that I am something that I'm not stupid despite all of my shortcomings like <laughs> that I have strong areas so I, I fought and I fought for, for years and years and years to try and get into some sort of education and then the job center in Norway Uh, agreed to kind of half subsidize or finance my private school for the two first years mm -hmm. but only if they could decide what I was going to study okay and so that's why I did graphic design because they decided that this was something that I would be able to do and make money from so anyway I was so motivated to just go and study and use my brain for something and so I thought I'm going to do this and I'm going to do it really well I'm going to prove to everyone that I can do something so I um, started university or vocational school of course nobody it, it's like high school over all, all over again except this time I'm in a relationship I have a boyfriend who I live with like I'm an adult I have an apartment mm -hmm. I have a family life like a dog I have a boyfriend All of that. So things are different in my Would private you say life. That, like your your social skills were better as well at that point. Yeah. Your, like your awareness of people. <laughs> yeah, of course. I was in my mid twenties, so I, and everything that I had been through had also taught me so much about kind of life struggles, empathy, and all of that. Yeah. So I ha I've I learned so uh, my learning curve was very very steep and. Um, like to try and survive and everything was just really <laughs> dramatic all the time. Mm -hmm. Like I even forgot to mention like my first job, like after I moved to Oslo when I was 20 without any education was in a kindergarten. And I sat in the toilet having my lunch and I ate my lunch in the toilet every time because I couldn't stand like sitting in the, the teacher's lounge. <laughs> yeah. The teacher's lounge yeah. with all the, the, daycare teachers or whatever yeah so uh, and also my boss there was really awful to me and, and harassed me and oh it was terrible so yeah that's also kind of why I felt like okay so get a a, a degree in something and nobody can ever touch you mm. and yeah you can do yeah. but who was I kidding everything despite feeling very very smart it doesn't help that you feel smart and and uh, experienced in life and all of that because it just shines through that you are different in one way or another people they notice and they they would notice also when i went to um uh, vocational the graphic design so the graphic design they 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 did not pick me on their groups yet again And I would end up alone with the leftovers to do the group assignments. I would always kind of take the lead role in every group assignment and did pretty well, actually, and, and won a, a couple of competitions. Wow. And uh, peop yeah, people would always be quite uh, surprised and set back that I uh, actually did anything, that I actually managed to do anything quite successful because when I started I had never even touched a Mac 
And I did not know what software was or anything. I was just thrown into it by that job center. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had to really, really learn the hard way. Whilst everyone else who were my classmates, they they had had Macs for years and were computer wizards and you know i had n- I, I knew nothing so it is just just kind of popped into my head it just it, it sounds like it sounds like just general life for an <laughs> autistic person in the social world everyone's got a yeah. mac everyone knows yeah. what they're doing we've got to learn it from scratch yeah. <laughs> it was really 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 intense and hard and i i remember i did all my design work and all my assignments mostly analog and i tried to use the printer and take pictures and then draw and so my my design style because of my lack of uh, technical competence in the beginning it kind of developed into a quite uh, distinguished like style and everybody called yeah. my design style quirky and standing out from the rest and i was like yeah well <laughs> Tell me something I didn't Story already know. Like, yeah, I am different from the rest. And also it's my design style. It's like, and soon people would start talking behind my back. And I actually heard back from later on that one of the people who were my teachers back then had gone on and spread rumors about me. One of your teachers? Yes, that should not be. I should sue. And uh, the person who told me was, uh, I mean, this would be like jumping so many stages ahead, but it would be my future ex-boyfriend who was friends with uh, the mm-hmm. girlfriend of my teacher. So that in the future. <laughs> so he would have tried before he, my future ex-boyfriend would date me, who was also a designer. He w- would have uh, asked around in the design uh, group uh, whatever in Oslo he would ask around about me like so do you know anything about Charlotte and then sh- he found out something about me when I was a student from way like years ago from the girlfriend of my old teacher like and he had said yeah Charlotte yes I remember her she was quite intense she had her own way of doing things and I remember the other students had complained about her doing things too different and in, uh, in her own way. She was very intense, but she did well. And I, I know this exactly because he showed me the text message. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, and then jump back years to when I was a student. I did things my own way, but that's why... I ended up when I my third year went to Southampton to finish my three years bachelor's degree. I uh, before I had finished university, I had sent concept work to some international and famous design blogs that if you were published there, then you you set for life. Yeah, no, or you would be seen. You would be seen by many in the industry, and that's exactly what happened to me. I. I sent some of my work in and I got published like two of my works got published uh, in a row wow. and I and I didn't even know and and I, when I suddenly started getting lots of emails from publishers that would ask me like can we please uh, use your work and publish it in our design magazine with a uh, <clears throat> The, these and these other designers as examples That's amazing. Of, yeah of creative uh, resumes and so and I got called up by the newspaper in in Norway even actually like the, it, there, it reached all over the world some of my designs because it was quirky that's what everybody said quirky and standing out from the rest <laughs> that's a good thing for people who are listening to take home with, yeah you know, quirkiness in a, in a social setting at school, maybe maybe not great for you. No. But in the working life. Yeah, so if you, if you have some sort of feeling that, okay, I can do things differently and do it well, uh, my, my, my advice is that you don't let anyone stop you. Just keep doing it because it will uh, show. People will notice and it's a good thing. But the thing is that, yeah, mm. 
I got broken down into pieces, like systematically, by people around me who were jealous, who who feared me, were like um, felt threatened by me. I got uh, uh, very severely bullied in uh, the last year by uh, the other Norwegian people in the Norwegian society of the people who also went to Southampton to take the last year. Mm-hmm. Something happened with the group of the Norwegian people uh, there who had uh, one time in a Christmas party, they pulled me aside and uh, told me, Charlotte, you can't behave the way you are behaving. You can't say things that you're saying. You're hurting people's feelings. Don't you see that? The way that you are, you, you're acting and behaving, you just, you simply can't say things the way you're saying them and I was so surprised because just minutes before uh, this person who told me this said that to me she had told me to just be myself and not Mm. don't you care about what anyone else tells you so this was gaslighting at high level I just uh, there's people just don't understand the the autistic brain do they they yeah. They say like be yourself, and then they don't realize yeah. that you know yourself is is so different from what what they expect you to. And then I was myself, like, and then minutes later, she takes me aside and like, hey, hey, hey. Can you just not be yourself? Yeah, yeah, please? yeah, yeah. Just, I, <laughs> just, I take it back. I take it back. Okay, don't be yourself. Yeah. But as I was sitting in that room uh, with my my mouth open out of shock not knowing what mm. to say. Another girl entered the room and said, hey, oh, what are you guys doing? That girl who was just now uh, giving it to me verbally, <laughs> she said, oh, come in, come yeah. in. I, I actually want to talk to you. You should be here with us. And I'm like, what? What's happening? And then she started asking leading questions to this new girl who entered the room and said, so tell us, how does Charlotte make you feel? And I would, I was right. like, "What?" And this person is just another member of the group. Yeah, like, the another. Group that you're in. Yeah, another Norwegian. Not in, like a teacher or. No, 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 another university. student. No. It was That's it, so weird. It's a student party with Norwegian students who had all gone there to take the last year, and then she she continued to answer and say, "Yeah, well, I I mean, Charlotte." sometimes you do hurt my feelings and I'm like no come on come on I never even hang out with these people and I just remember feeling like everything started spinning around me and I did not know that I was about to have a huge meltdown in front of these people who would witness who would witness me having the worst meltdown I've ever had in public. And of course it ended in catastrophe because they cornered me. I it it was it ended up really, really, really badly. They started then spreading the most horrendous rumors about me being insane and crazy. Oh, yeah. And it followed me all the way back to Oslo after that third year and uh, after I worked in London and I came back to Oslo. Everybody kind of in the design industry in Oslo knew because of these other people who had went gone back to Oslo to get jobs. And they worked in various design agencies around mm-hmm. the city. So I, I couldn't go anywhere. Everybody so knew kind me. Of spreading rumors about you and decrediting you and stuff. Yes, they totally, totally. Like, how can people do that? So, yeah, they that, that bullying thing is uh, the worst thing. That's awful. That's when I first con- started to... Uh, notice uh, s- the feeling of s- suicidal thoughts. You must be f- feel very lonely. Yeah, it was. Not being able to be yourself, not being able to, ever having to literally put on that mask and mm. hide y- y- your true self. It was awful because uh, I was alone there in the in the UK. And uh, but anyway, after that, I kind of uh, started to not care anymore about anything almost Mm. Uh, because I I wanted to die but because I I kind of didn't care anymore 
I, I, I accepted someone who asked me out on a date and I just became friends with this whole other group of people who were also Norwegian people, but not designers. They were shipping students. And the weird thing is that they are completely different people than designers. Designers are weird. But so I hung out with these spoiled rich kids (laughs) studying shipping in uh, Southampton. It was so weird. And uh, I was dating this this, uh, guy. And uh, who took me out to dinners and bought me Dom Perignon and uh, <laughs> and 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 steak dinners and stuff. And I was like, this is completely not my style. But you know what? Rather do this than walking around the streets getting spat at. You know, because they would they would literally like almost spit on me when I walked past them because it was a small God. town. These Norwegian yeah. design students, they were awful to me after that meltdown I had at that party. But uh, so I, I and then I started to become friends with the British students. And then some, suddenly just everything turned out completely wonderful. The last uh, the, the, the last half year of my uh, year. Uh, yeah, that's so strange that you say that, because one of the, the running themes in a lot of my life was because I, di- I really didn't fit in with British people, with the people mm-hmm. around me, people of, of different cultures and, and backgrounds mm-hmm. and places, I, d- I just felt so much more kind of on, on their wavelength. And like this one time I went on this Japanese exchange and Ooh. I went from being this isolated, shy guy mm-hmm. to like... <laughs> like the main man, like the main British dude that all these Japanese yeah. people would talk to, and it was so strange. It yeah, was just, I know it was that. mad, but it's it's a new perspective, isn't it? New kind of like J- Japanese culture, it's the language was, thing. Yeah, language, but also culture, like kind of being a bit more withdrawn oh, and yeah, respectable, and oh, you're so lucky to have been there on, on exchange. I know, oh yeah. God. I did get to do a lot of things when I was younger. You're still young. So young. <laughs> mm, 14. You were 14 <laughs> when you did it? Yeah. Oh my god! <laughs> what? Went to Osaka and I stayed in a bamboo hut. How long? And went to Tokyo. <laughs> Three weeks. Oh, okay. I thought this was like when you were in university and was like a whole Oh, no, no. I didn't like move over there. It was like oh, okay. they came over and we showed them around. Well, still, it's a nice uh, experience. Mm. In terms of like university experiences for me, is because because in my my first and second years, um, I was I was deep into the world of taekwondo, so my life consisted mm. of going to university, getting my assi- my assignments done, maybe chatting to my housemates who kind of didn't particularly like me but liked me because I was good at sports, mm. and so I did that university then went to taekwondo which took me a long time to get to like three hour round trips two hour oh, round trips yeah. just to go train for like an hour or two mm. so that filled up the majority of my life and obviously my girlfriend who I went to see on the weekend mm. and sh- she was basically my only kind of my only tie to uh, socializing pretty much mm. but when when she went to university in my second year she she moved very very far away and moved and then broke up with me oh. I was so alone mm. I was awful I started working on myself this was kind of the the, the growth period for me my social uh, social journey um, started reading started learning about dating and friendships mm. and my brain and autism mental health mm. reading constantly on wow. it I was in a really bad patch made friends with one of the people who was like a medical student and um, it was t- two medical students and I, I hang, hung out with mm. them because they did work all the time. So I joined in and then we, we moved in the next year. But then because my girlfriend, my ex-girlfriend broke up with me, I was in a really, really bad place and it was the only thing I could think mm. about all the time. I had like an existential crisis. I um, properly broke down, didn't, go out of my house for weeks completely isolated watching youtube videos on repeat and 
constant panic attacks throughout the day all the time. And then I just decided one day to go to this party. Um, and I met who's, who's now to be one of my best friends ever. Awesome. But I was, I, w- I was definitely in a bad place. And uh, I, I made an attempt on my life at oh, that point. So sorry. And it was, it was quite a sort of severe when I took quite strong medication and, and alcohol. And it was a really, really bad, bad time. But that friend that I made actually um, was worried about me because I told her that I was feeling really bad. Yeah. And so she got, she rang up and she got um, one of the security to go check on me. And it was, it was kind of just in time oh, wow. to sort of send me to the hospital and stuff. I'm so glad that she <laughs> uh, did. Mm. Yeah. I wasn't happy with oh, her. Man. But I understood why she did it, and now obviously I'm, you know, eternally grateful. Oh, yeah. But it was, it was, it was awful. Lot. The next year, I just decided to get away from it. Went to Thailand to do it to do my placement. You know, like you went to UK, I went to Thailand. Mm. They didn't understand autism. I was quite heavily isolated by the, the the other lab mates. They they got on really well with the rest of the UK students. I went over, and they they just hated me. Oh, no. Even even my boss, my supervisor, didn't understand, and a lot of it was kind of it was difficult because like, I was trying to do research on my own, and I, I helped them out with their projects, and then when it came for mine, they didn't help me at all. Oh no, people are cruel. So I felt very isolated, but it was the first time that I actually made a group of friends, mm. and I felt a part of a group, and um, I went traveling with. One of the guys that I, I grew quite fond mm. of went around Southeast Asia for about two months. That's great. Lovely. Came back to finish my fourth year. Oh, uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. A lot of it was isolation, very isolated. Yeah. The bullying was whenever we had group work. So mm-hmm. I was in a group of girls. And uh, because, you know, as you said, I, I had quite a quirky way of sort of doing projects and stuff. Mm. And I, I was good at IT and I, I knew how to do all of the, the editing and stuff. And mm-hmm. there was one point which I didn't agree with them and they didn't like what I did. So they just asked me to go home. Whoa. Wow. Yeah. That's cruel. Yeah. That was pretty much the only bullying other than Thailand. Um, most of it was being very isolated. Mm. But things have improved, obviously, like massively. But isolation is kind of the worst form of bullying, though. Feeling like you're invisible, like you, it's kind of even worse than having words shouted at you. Because then you, at least you are, ex- you exist. But if people like don't even yeah, acknowledge you, then you're. It can feel even so much more detrimental. What was your um, experience of work? kind of workplace bullying and isolation? Well, I'm glad you asked because I have so much to say on that matter. No, uh, I'm not. Yeah, well, the thing is, so after university, I was headhunted um, to um, work at a very big name brand agency in uh, London. And uh, they discovered me on DNAD New Blood uh, exhibition in London. Uh, where we uh, exhibited our student work from mm. our final year and they uh, walk around there and then they contact people they want to co- have come work for them so I uh, got the the call and uh, I just yeah all right I didn't really understand like how big that is because nobody else got a call from that big agencies so yeah. <laughs> I, I I kind of realized as the year went by after university how big of a deal it kind of was but the thing is that there were placements as an in internships of course in the mm-hmm. beginning when I was like brand new fresh out of university it was really 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 hard to uh, get into an office environment uh, in uh, London. So I guess you wouldn't have had many any of the accommodations and stuff because you haven't been diagnosed No, yes, so that's also everything up until uh, recently. I've gone undiagnosed, not understanding anything about why I didn't fit in uh, as well Mm. as everyone else and why I uh, had so much difficulties 
socially. So of mm. course, uh, my my um, my first uh, years in uh, the design industry were really, really, really hard on me. So uh, I, I um, struggled socially with uh, getting um, friends, uh, with colleagues. Yeah. I struggled with understanding like the social bits that I, that are so important for for forming um, teamwork. Yeah. And if if I if you don't kind of fit into the social bits so that people want to work on the team with you, then you're screwed and kind of then you never get any of the cool projects to work on and mm. therefore never you're able to show your true talent and skill. I ended up with all of my talent being headhunted and all that kind of in the paper room cutting paper and it was like so much work that I'd done and I didn't ask for that That's job. Awful. I didn't ask for that job, but I came all the way from Norway to London and with two suitcases that I had to roll all over London from job to job. To cut paper. Yeah. Uh, and then not ending up getting kind of the contract to stay on. Yeah. Each and every design agency that I applied to, I got the job as an intern. And every internship, when you are a, a junior designer, they only are for one month. So I stayed one month at each place. And none of the other people that I had uh, graduated with had gotten even one single internship anywhere. Whilst I, I kept getting internships and offers from agency after agency and the biggest names. But I could not get kind of a, a contract to stay on because I guess it just shone through that I was like really different. <laughs> so they, yeah, they didn't sign me on. But at the end, there was a big company that wanted to keep me on. But mm -hmm. then by that time, I had I, I had become burned out, so I had to quit and uh, move back to Norway. Yeah, that was kind of uh, gutting. Yeah, because you have you've got so much so much talent and so much expertise and ability to to mm -hmm. work in that area, and you've yeah. got you've got the difference and the the, the quirkiness, which is important for. Standing out and making creative stuff, and yeah, I mean, like the, the design uh, when you're designing, the whole point of it is to catch people's attention. And I, I know how I knew very well how to do that, I still know somewhat how to do that, but but nobody would kind of give me the opportunity. There are so many horrible bosses out there, that's my point. If I uh, am boss to a creative team, then of course I hire people who are better than me. Never hire anyone who is uh, not better than you. I mean, like, what's yeah. the point of that? You're supposed to hire yeah. people who are better than you and then you're supposed to help them get even better because that's how you make a big, successful uh, work yeah. environment and company and product or whatever. But I did not understand like how people could like hire me on like the big talent and then just shove me away in the copy room. Like what, what? And I can tell you that so many bosses out there in huge agencies, they are missing out and they're wasting money. They're wasting billions. Just because they have a, a big ego, big superior superiority complex superiority complex it, it, it's not smart mad managing and then uh, when i came back to norway uh burnt out and everything i spent half a year resting up and then i started applying to jobs in oslo and i got a job uh, right away i never had any problems getting a job with my portfolio and then my excellent like uh, work uh, experience from london and the huge name agencies everybody wanted like oh wow you worked there on there wow and, and <laughs> so it was not a problem getting a like a, a steady job with a contract mm. and l much higher salary than i would ever get in london and uh, so i was like really satisfied i was really happy 
but it did not take more than half a year in my first job in Oslo before I started getting like uh, sick and I had to go on sick leaves here and there for a couple of days here and a couple of days there because I, I was so burned out. Mm. My my skills were never lifted up. I was always set to do uh, the lousy jobs. Like I, 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 I didn't get the jobs that I was supposed to get, you know. And do you think that's that's a lot to do with you being being autistic, you having those those differences in your social communication? Mm-hmm. Definitely. So there was the daily manager who is not a designer. She did not take a liking to me uh, after she had hired me. She liked me the first <laughs> couple of weeks or whatever, but as it turns out after a little while when people have heard me talking enough they don't like me anymore because I'm too honest I uh, pointed out mistakes that were being made and things that could be done better and I, I, I started being very proactive and I came up with many ways to improve existing designs on packaging that they already had with clients and the, the manager, she hated that I did that because she wanted to be the one who came up with all the ideas. And to this day, I don't understand why on earth she would be feeling threatened by the designer when that's why she hired me. Mm. I don't know if it's something about my way of being because when I start opening my mouth and I start to talk, I, am, I sound so determined and I sound so confident. And everybody says, oh, you have such good self-esteem and wow, you're such a good talker. But actually, I don't, I don't feel that way at all. I feel really insecure and unconfident and all of that. And I just wing it all of the time. But I am genuinely motivated and I'm honestly trying to do something good. Uh, that's why I get so disappointed every time when people seem to just knock me down, like say, no, sorry, this idea, I don't think we can go with it. Just because they doesn't agree with what they think. They, they just don't like that I'm sounding so confident. Who do you think you are, Charlotte? Well, you, you've got no reason to... I mean, it's easy to say you've got no reason to feel insecure, but like, just, just think of what we're doing now. You're on a podcast talking in, in a second language you know when you, you're autistic it's kind of it's... a first language <laughs> first language okay your first language it's kind of <laughs> no it's not it's the second language of course <laughs> we talk english so much in norway yeah so. but, but still yeah still like it's a hard thing to do neurotypical people struggle to do it to be honest before this podcast before uh, every time we are going to we tried to have this podcast, I was really, really, really nervous and so tight in my stomach. And I felt like I was going to get sick. And so nobody can ever tell. And what, why? Because I'm so freaking good at masking. I think like after this, I will keep kind of like a long, longer version because I think like we, we've talked about a lot of important stuff it's hard because i'm trying to like cut my podcast down but the, the main reason mm -hmm. why i get in to do these podcasts is to kind of explore topics and yeah relate to other people and and listen about their experiences and their thoughts and stuff but it's like people yeah. don't want to click on something that's that's longer than an hour or, or at least longer than no, 15 minutes um even yeah of course which is uh i know which is it's just you have hard. to short it down <laughs> you just have to like uh, have no breaks in between and then you just hear saying like yeah and then and then click and then <laughs> click <Yeah. laughs> i didn't even get to the worst parts of the bullying or whatever <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> sorry it's all right don't worry about it it's you get into zone don't oh, you man. it's just like like a, yeah. a monologuing zone, I do that. Yeah. Um, oh, I'm sorry. You, you have to just cut me off. Uh, is this you telling me that we are we're finished talking now? No. 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 It's not. No. Oh. Oh. 
Okay, okay. See, I just have to. I don't even know that. Remember, I'm autistic as well. I'll tell you. Ah, uh, yeah. Yes, that's good. <laughs> that's great. There's a few questions that on there that we didn't cover, but mm -hmm. I think like the main like way that to kind of round up the podcast is to talk about how we can deal with all this stuff. How can we make it better for other kids who are possibly going through similar experiences, or other adults who are, you know, kind of lonely and and, and bullied and isolated? How do we overcome it? Well. That's a good question. We need to <laughs> spread awareness, difficult. and yeah, I I think th this thing that we are doing is helpful. Not too long ago, I didn't have anything like this where that I could find and uh, and find uh, any support and relate to stories like this. So I think uh, that is something that can, that helps us overcome these difficulties like that people can find uh, support and help relatability and the things Real, that we watch yeah. and listen to and yeah engage in on on, on our little worlds and our phones <laughs> yeah what <laughs> in our little worlds like in our bubble you know just kind of learning about autism and and oh yeah relating yeah. To, to other autistic people and yeah i think i, I do agree with you i think I think a lot of the, the work needs to be done by autistic people and kind of the more stuff that we can make on it, the more likely it is to become popular and the more, you know, the more yes. people are going to watch it and listen to it. And then it's going to hopefully, which is my main goal, is to bring all of us to the mainstream media and, and yes. you know, really push for changes because um, yeah. it's, it's really unacceptable that autistic people so often have to deal with so much negativity and trauma and horrible life experiences it's, it's really just not and not and for it. what for just uh, mm. for being slightly different in the way to communicate so uh, exactly. you know that girl nor that i told you about in when i was 10 when she was yeah. 13 or something i remember she was crying about a boy in in, in we were in the in the city, I don't know, I was hanging out with her and some other girls, and uh, she was crying, and I tried to comfort her, and my way of trying to comfort her was to lick tears off her face. <laughs> 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 so that was my way of, of uh, communicating uh, comfort yeah. for, for, for a, a girl who had already seen me as the weirdo, I wasn't less weird in her eyes now. She said, what are you doing? <laughs> and I was, I, I, don't, I don't know. I had seen animals licking each other's face in The Lion King, <laughs> trying to lick the learning, and... <laughs> learning from movies. <laughs> like, That's another autism and, thing. Yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> yes, yes. And I, so I licked tears off my bully's <laughs> face one time even. That's a different way Brilliant. of communicating. <laughs> I love that now. <laughs> Yeah. That's great. Yes. I have been nothing but kind and all I've gotten, what did I get in return? <laughs> it's like like the way that we translate our inner self and inner world is just so different that it comes across in the complete opposite way to yes. how we are. Yeah. <laughs> so if somebody calls you stupid, you feel like the urge to say, I'm not stupid. I'm actually very smart. It just sounds... <laughs> How are you now? You're a bit <laughs> egotistical. No. no, I'm just correcting you. <laughs> Got a measured IQ of 240. Oh, do you? <laughs> Not really. No. no. <laughs> that was my attempt at a joke. Yeah. <laughs> so just to kind of um, round up the podcast, I usually ask for kind of three main things that you want people to remember or you want people to take away. It doesn't have to be like a recall of the things that we talked about because I know we've we've talked for quite a bit. It's, it's going to sound so cheesy. I, I would say to anyone who may be listening to this and if they feel like there is no hope, there is hope. Definitely, there is hope. That is number one. Don't hate yourself for being different. Don't blame yourself 
I would say that we blame ourselves too. We 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 punish ourselves too much. So we need to stop punishing ourselves and uh, and uh, just know that yeah, it's it's natural to be different. It's nothing wrong with it. And uh, number three is just continue being nice to people even though other people are cruel and mean i love that one because if you if, if you if you give into it and you, you you start to become that kind of mean and, and bitter person then you know you'll have reason inside yourself as mm-hmm. well as as the outside and that's like the the i think one of the the traps of of being autistic the falling into that very bitter negative horrible mindset towards yes people. and it will eat you alive and it uh, destroys destroys you from inside and also to just um, try to be cruel back to someone who was cruel to you it mm. won't make you feel better it will just manifest yeah. and eat you up uh, just pay it back with kindness as even though it hurts it will feel better later on when you think back thank you very much you're welcome got the last the last question Mm -hmm. the very last one which is an open question what does autism mean to you charlotte well um that was that came abruptly what do you think about when you think of autism i think about freedom freedom and that may sound strange but the truth shall set you free kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of liberating. If um, people could just uh, start to accept people being different, neurodiversity, that we have different neurotypes and all that, I just think we could go so far, everybody here in this society on the planet. And that is, um, it feels that thought just feels liberating there's so much goodness in autism and um, there would be like (laughs) no bad things on the planet it would be just good things and uh, nobody would suffer or anything I, i know that sounds really rosy but i honestly like somebody asked me how would the world look like if it was only clones of you? <laughs> uh, I, I'm like, only clones of me? Well, that would look like... Advertisement would definitely be very good. <laughs> well, oh, it wouldn't be advertising. But, but I mean, like, then the whole world would be autistic, uh, of course, if it was just clones of me. It would be a bit boring with just the same person. But I can tell you that it would be environmentally friendly... There would be animals walking in the streets, train lines on magnetic fields in the air. So, but they wouldn't be too, <laughs> they, they wouldn't be so high that they would hurt the birds. N- nobody would be rude to each other. Everybody would just be so kind. That's how things would be in my cloned world. It would be like unicorns and rainbows, literally, without all of the the hate. You genetically engineer some unicorns. It will be co- ca- cotton candy clouds, and there Rainbow will be machines. yes, every there will be so much fun. Aqua parks and water <laughs> and steaming stations everywhere. It will be so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> this comes to the the end of our long discussion. Mm-hmm. The life of an autistic person. The the trauma, the bullying, the isolation, the negativity, but we still manage to end on a positive. Yeah. You know, always a bit of fun. That is <laughs> that is the tragic thing about all of this. No matter how hard we are all stricken, we still manage somehow to keep this joyous undertone that just keeps on coming up. Brilliant. Yeah. Where can people find you, Charlotte? Currently only on Instagram on the Spectrum Girl. And uh, I mm-hmm. hopefully I have I want to start uh, YouTubing, vlogging. Ooh. Yeah. We'll see. But one thing at a time. Yeah. So if you want to 
find the 40 Audio Podcast on any other place. You can always find it on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube under Asperger's Growth or under the 40 Audio Podcast on the others. If you want to stay up to date with my social medias, see what I'm doing behind the scenes, see all the advocacy work that I'm doing out in the, the dangerous world of the mainstream media, then you can follow my accounts all at Asperger's Growth, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And if you have your own story and you want to come on, share your experience and knowledge on a particular su- <coughs> <laughs> on a particular subject around autism and mental health, you can always contact me on my email, aspergesgrowth at gmail.com. And that's pretty much all the places you can find me. Charlotte, thank you so much for coming on and sharing, being so open and honest with your experiences. Yes, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank it was my pleasure. <laughs> thank you so much. I really enjoyed talking to you. You're a great conversationalist. And um, yeah, like, <laughs> please, anybody out there, go and check out Charlotte's page. She's amazing at putting out images. I know you only yes, started in definitely. 2020, but yes. like, you've got so many followers. I'm going to quit if I don't reach 10,000 followers by uh, December. Okay, everybody, no, follow. <laughs> follow the Spectrum Girl account. <laughs> just joking. I'm joking. Okay. I'm joking. I'm not going to. We'll do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do it anyway. Do it. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I hope you've got something from this podcast, everybody out there listening to us monologuing about autism. Hopefully, I'll be able to get it out for Anti Bullying Week. I think it'd be a really good episode to put out. Um, good to raise awareness. So share it with anyone that you come across, any family members, friends, people within your communities. Always helps out. And yeah, I'll see you in the next podcast. That's awesome. Cool.